Well, good morning. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, we had a great first service and had some folks give their life to Jesus and uh, had some baptisms in that first service. Yeah, go ahead and thank the Lord for that. I did have somebody ask me after the first service, how come you didn't talk very much about football? Um, Because we lost. That's why, and I... I, uh, I lost a bet with one of our teenagers, so I'll just, there's that, there's that nasty thing. So uh, anyway, I fulfilled my bet. There we go. Uh, hey, today, let me welcome you. Thank you for coming, and thank you for being here in our services today. Uh, if you're a guest, uh, we would love to tell you about our church, answer any questions you may have. Uh, you could help us out by filling out one of our guest registration cards. Do that one of two ways. You can fill out one of the cards that are in the chair back pockets around this room, or you can do it electronically. There'll be a slide on the screens at the end of the service that'll kind of kind of lead you through that process of texting the word guest to a number that is there. Today is a, uh, is a special day in the life of our church. It's a day of baby dedication. And um, we, uh, between the first and second service, uh, we're dedicating 20, 20 babies today. And uh, we just did this a few months ago. Uh, for the life of me, I can't figure out what's going on. Um, <laughs> but uh, we are blessed. We are blessed with a church that is filled with young families and loud children and babies. And uh, we're thankful for that. And we, are, uh, we understand the responsibility that we have uh, to sow into the life of this child and also these families. I just want to remind uh, the parents today, these children are not going to remember today. This is, not, this is not really for them. This is for you. And we never want this to be misunderstood that this dedication is something that is putting this child in a right relationship with God. Now, what this dedication is doing is, it is you as parents and the church family saying that we're joining together and we are going to use every resource we have to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our prayer is that one day, one day, they would put their faith and trust in Jesus and that God would use them to do great and mighty things for his glory. So uh, today we have, again, in this service, 13 13 that we will be dedicating. Uh, They will receive a gift bag. And I always like to tell you guys what's in it because we we used your money to buy it. Um, There'll be a baby dedication certificate that they receive. Also a baby's first Bible. They'll receive a baby scripture swaddle blanket. I don't even even know what that is. Um, (laughs) It sounds pretty cool though. A bedtime devotions book with uh, D- devotions with Jesus book, and uh, Pastor Johnny Hunt led uh, a group of pastors to to do this a couple of years ago, and so we uh, we we handed that out, or that'll be in your bags, and I had the opportunity to write in this as well. You'll get the much coveted HP Kids bag tag, and uh, if you'll uh, go to the grocery store with that bag tag on your uh, diaper bag, um, people will know you go to church here. Is all I know. <laughs> Parent Life Magazine. Hey, there's going to be a letter in there that, that I've written to them that I want you to hold on to, parents, until they turn 12. And, pl- and there's no, that's not a magical age. That's not an age of accountability. Some of them will trust Jesus before them. Some of them may not. But it's just kind of a letter that I've written. And this is what I've been praying for them, not only for today, but all the way up until the age of 12. And uh, I, I've just found that, uh, you know, usually age 12, 13, they uh, unplug their brains. And so uh, I thought that might be a good time for them to read that. And then you'll also receive pictures of the dedication service. And Miss Tammy, I'm sure it's got something in there, in there to let you know how you can receive this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce these families to you. We're going to give them their gift. And then we're going to have a special time of covenant for the parents uh, as they make a covenant to the Lord and to you as their church family. And then there'll be a time, where's the church family? You make a covenant to these parents and to the Lord as we all partner together to raise these children in the ways of the Lord. They say this, they say it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, I disagree with that. I'd say it takes a church. 
I'd say it takes a church to raise a child in a God-honoring fashion. Thank you for being that church. All right, Miss Tam, how about you get your folks ready? And we will do some introductions this morning. And Miss Tammy has worked with me to make sure I get everybody's name right. And, uh, and so if we mess up, it's my fault, not hers. Let me introduce these folks to you. First of all, we have the Bell family. And we have Charlotte Olivia Bell, born on November the 27th, 2019. And this is Miss Nora Madeline Bell, born on March the 19th, 2021. Dad is Aaron Mom is Kayla. What a beautiful family. Would you help me welcome this family this morning? They're going to get our pictures right here. Hey, look right here, sweetie. Look right here. Fantastic. It's my beautiful helper. Looking very nice today. That's my wife, in case you don't know. Let me give you that. Mom. Some, some of you were going to go somewhere you didn't need to. All right. Hey, let me introduce this family. We have Charlie Joseph Brown. Is that you, Charlie? There he is right there. Born on October the 4th, 2018. Did you have powdered sugar on your eggs this morning? <laughs> <laughs> and then we have uh, Kelsey Amelia Cole, and y'all are calling her Kels. Is that right? Fantastic. Born on February the 1st, 2022. Dad Jacob, Mom Kayla. Help me welcome these guys today. Would you do that? Okay, let's, let's, we're going to get our picture right here. Awesome. Yeah, yes, yeah, she did. I'm going to get you. You hold yours, and you hold sisters, okay? Fantastic. Great job. All right. Here we go. Ezekiel Philip Chestnut. And y'all calling him Zeke. Awesome. Do what some of you are? All right, is there some tension between mom and dad over this? Yes, sir. All right, we can set you up a counseling appointment. <laughs> Zeke, born on August the 15th, 2022. And this is dad, Gary, mom, Jara, and brothers and sisters, Zane, Aiden, and Allie. What a great looking family there. Help me welcome them today. Would you do that? Hey, y'all look up here. Let's get our picture. All right. <laughs> there you go. Can, you going to hold it? You got it? Thank you, buddy. Thank you. All right. The Clarks. Aiden Oliver Clark. Which one's Aiden? There's Aiden. All right. Eli James Clark. And they were both born on May the 2nd, 2022. Identical? Are they identical twins? No. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Y'all might want to quit dressing them like that. Uh, but anyway, and this is Ty and Catherine. Ty is our minister of community outreach here at our church. And uh, the other boys, you have they're, they're at grandmama's house this weekend, right. right? All right. Help me welcome the Clarks today. Would you do that? <laughs> Fantastic. I think they put them both in one bag there. All right. Mr. Jeremiah. Hey, buddy. How are you doing? You know your name, don't you? Yes, sir. Jeremiah Lee Crisp, born on January the 23rd, 2022. Dad Samuel, Mom Corey. I hear you. I don't like shoes either. <laughs> Beautiful family. Would you help me welcome the Crisp today? We're going to get our picture Fantastic. Dad, let me give you that. All right. Joseph Lee Crowley. And y'all calling him Joey. Fantastic. Born on August the 23rd, 2022. I know, I know. Oh, he doesn't like me. Dad, Darian, Mom, Autumn. Is, is, is he, you going to make him an ag too? All right. An Aggie fan. Yeah. Maybe not this season. Next year. All right. Would you help me welcome this family today? Hey guys, I'm gonna 
fantastic. There we go. Give you that, Dad. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. We have Elise Devera Hampton. Did I get that right? June the 17th, 2022. Got big sister here? Yeah? That's correct. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Dad, Matthew, Mom, Sydney. Beautiful family. Help me welcome them today. Would you do that? Can you look right here and get a piece of Awesome. Thank you, guys. Will you hold sister's bag? There you go. Thank you. All right. Let's see here. Daniel Anthony Lucan. <laughs> He's excited. He's rubbing his feet together. Do you see that? He's so excited. Do it, doing the Irish jig. He's doing the Irish jig. I didn't know there was such a thing. Born on April the 9th, 2022, Dad Andrew, Mom Karina. Fantastic. Would you help me welcome this family today? <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, we got a gift for you. Thank you. Go, Dad. All right. Hank Marshall Oswald. He opened his eyes. I don't see him open his eyes a lot. I know, right? Anyway, I call him Hammering Hank. They've not told me it's okay, but, you know, I guess if he doesn't play baseball, we'll figure something yeah. else out. Hank Marshall Oswald, born on August the 28th, 2022. Dad Nick, Mom Katie, and he's wide awake now. Mm -hmm. Yep, supposed to be born in Georgia, and he decided, nope, I want to be a Floridian, and went ahead and did that. Help me welcome this family today. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Katie. All right. Last but not least, Miss Lila Air Steed. Did I get that right, Mom? June the 15th, 2022. Mom, Jennifer, big brother. Gage and Mom, Grandma. Yes. Fantastic. Beautiful family. Hey, sweet girl. I was going to see if she'd talk, but I forgot she can't. Help me welcome them today. Would you do that? <laughs> Fantastic. What beautiful. Families, if y'all would just stay right there. I want to go through the covenant today. And uh, again, you'll have a copy of this. And this is what we are committing to, to God and church family as well. Parents, you'll be able to see it on the back screens There'll be four questions that I ask you, and if you so agree, if you would respond with, we do, we do, uh, that would be helpful. First of all, recognizing the tremendous responsibility of being a parent and knowing of your dependency upon God for strength and wisdom to faithfully fulfill your duties as parents, do you now present your child before God in dedication? We do. As a parent, do you covenant with God to bring up your child in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and to assist your child in growing as Jesus did, in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Because you desire for your child to have a knowledge of the Scriptures and a loving and obedient attitude toward God and His Son, Jesus Christ, do you promise to use your home and the organizations of this church to accomplish this task? Amen. And then finally, parents, Realizing that you are weak and that your wisdom will be limited, and I'd like to add your patience and your checkbook will all be limited at times. <laughs> Do you commit your all to Christ, that you may live a life that will glorify God and one that will be a role model for your child? We do. We do. Amen. Church family, we now come to the covenant of the church. I would ask you if you would join with us in making these commitments to please stand to your feet right now. And i like for these parents to look all across this room. You've got an army here that is praying, that is going to help you in this task, as well as we had a great crowd in the first service that will be happy to help you in this, in this task. Church, I have three questions I would like to ask you. And if you would respond with, we do at the end of all three. Recognizing the responsibility that you have as a congregation toward these children. Do you agree to deal with them lovingly? and tenderly, 
And do you seek to manifest the Christian spirit toward them always? Do you promise to provide spiritual instruction for them at this church, giving of your time, your talents, and your money to make this possible so long as you are a part of this congregation? And then finally, church family, do you promise to encourage these parents as they seek to be the very best Christian parents that they can be? We do. Today, uh, we are honored Uh, You know, uh, I've got one of my great friends and one of my mentors here whose great son is Hammerin' Hank, and he's being dedicated. So I've asked Pastor Johnny Hunt. Pastor Johnny, would you come up here? And he's going to lead us. You can't hear me? All right, you can kind of, they can kind of hear me over here. You all can hear me though, right? All right. So y'all just need to sit somewhere else. I don't don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. But I've asked Pastor Johnny to come. Say a few words, and he's going to lead us in our prayer today. Pastor Johnny, you come. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, just a moment of reflection. Uh, Seventy years ago, this year, I would have been in the arms of my mother, Betsy May Oxley. Twenty-two years after then, my wife and I stood with our daughter that is here in the room today. And at 22, God blessed us and gave us our daughter Deanna, and we dedicated her to the Lord. I became a Christian, making the single greatest decision of my life when I was 20. And then, at the age of 46, God gave us our first granddaughter. That's Katie, that is standing here now. And then, 22 years after then, God gave us our great-grandson, Hank. And I believe that's the last generation I'll get to see. Um, I was reading this morning, you can go to your Bible and it is replete with promises. But you can actually Google the five, what would be considered greatest blessings and promises in the Bible. But at the top of the list would be where God spoke to Moses and said, Moses, speak to Aaron, who leads the family of the priest and pray this blessing over Israel. And it's the blessing that I want to pray over this group. And then I want to add, in closing, the words of Carrie Job's song that reminds us that we want God to bless your family and your children and their children and their children. And I told my wife, I said, there's a reason that's as far as they went. Uh, You'd have to live to be about 100 to see another generation. But here's the prayer, and I'm going to ask you to bow with me in prayer, and let's ask God to bless these families. Lord, in the words of Moses given by God to these precious families as they dedicate their children, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you, and the Lord give you peace. Give these families wisdom to raise their children in such a way that you would be honored and you would be glorified. Thank you for making that provision available to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, parents. You may go be seated or wherever you're headed next. I want to ask our ushers to go ahead, if they would go ahead and come forward, and we continue to worship today, giving a tithe and an offering, and church family, you saw before you today why it's important for us to be faithful with our resources, because God uses that to help us as we minister to these children and their families. But today we give because we have been richly blessed, and we give out obedience to the Lord and so there are many different ways that you can give today. You can do it uh, by placing something in this offering bucket as it comes by. There are red drop boxes that are located all around the room. Or you can give electronically through your phone. And you'll see that on the screens. That's how I did mine this morning, our text to give. So the way that you give, not nearly as important as the obedient act of worship in giving. And so today, let me lead us in a word of prayer. And then after I pray, we'll continue to worship through giving and through singing. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we come to you today, and again, we celebrate what we've just been a part of. Father, thank you for being able to be a church that you give the awesome opportunity and responsibility to invest in the lives of these children and their families. Father, we thank you that as we walk down the halls of our church, we see people of all ages, young and old alike. And Father, we know that you love each and every one, and they are equally important to you. And Father, we thank you that you have blessed our church with many different generations. Thank you that the gospel is available to all who will believe. And God, thank you today that we can worship a, a Father in heaven that is good and a Father in heaven that is modeled and given an example to us of what a godly parent is to look like. Oh God, today may you be honored and glorified through this service. May the name of Jesus be the name that we speak of. And may the name of Jesus be what is said when they talk of Highland Park Church. We love you and we know that we love you because you have first loved us. And so today may you take this gift back and may you bless it and multiply it and use it to do exceedingly more than could be done if we held on to it ourselves. Thank you again, Jesus, for loving us so much that you would die on the cross and took our place. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He Yeah. 
stand before you this morning, Lord, we know that you can change lives today. Lord, that sickness can be healed, or addictions broken, marriage is healed, and we know that you can save in this place today. Oh God, so we will give you all the glory and all the praise, because only you are worthy. God, so we lift you up, and it's in that name, the holy and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can be seated. If you have a Bible this morning, please take that Bible, and uh, I'm going to throw you a curveball. Go to the book of Deuteronomy. (laughs) Yeah, I know we're supposed to be in Romans. I get that. I know we're supposed to be starting chapter 16 today. We will next week, and we'll begin our march to finish that thing up in a few weeks. But today, I want to go to the book of Deuteronomy. I, I feel as though this will be very appropriate in the day that we're in, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Please find that, verses 4 through 9 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Today we're talking about how to be a faithful parent. I can remember when we had our oldest, who is now 21 years old. And I can remember I was pastoring the first little church I pastored in North Mississippi, And the doctor that we were using was across the state line in rural South Tennessee. And when Jennifer went into labor and we headed off up to the hospital, this is a little hospital that would maybe have one delivery a week. And the the day that we went in, they had seven. Yes. And so they were overwhelmed. They were bringing nurses from every other department in the world. And so we were there. This hospital no longer even exists. They tore it down because they didn't have enough traffic, I guess. But anyway, so after a long day of of laboring and Abby finally came and they finally got us into a room, we were kind of down this long corridor where it felt as though no one else was there after the grandparents had left and Jennifer's exhausted, and, and so I'm there, and I have Abby, and Jennifer is, has gone to sleep in the bed, and everybody has left the room, and I'm in this old-timey rocking chair, and as I'm rocking her, and I'm thinking, this is pretty cool. They're letting me keep her, <laughs> and I fell asleep holding our newborn daughter in my arms in this rocking chair. And then I woke up, and it was early in the morning, late at night, you know, and I can remember thinking, oh, this was not good that I fell asleep with her in my arms. But even more alarming to me was nobody seemed to care. (laughs) No one came to say, hey, we need her back. And so I can remember walking to the door and kind of looking out in the hallway and making this statement, is there anyone there? Nobody answered. I saw no one. I walked out in the hallway, and I'm like, is there anyone there to help? And eventually, this nurse came, and everything was taken care of. But guys, I want to tell you something. What a testimony that the modern-day family 
needs to hear because I believe the modern day family is doing just that. Is there anybody there? Is there anybody there to help? And everyone from all the way to the government to Dr. Phil is trying to tell us how to do it. And yet there's only one that's given us the truth on how to do it. And that is God himself. I want you to look at the words that he gives to Moses right here a long, long time ago, the formula of how to be a faithful parent. Verse 4 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. I want to challenge every daddy and every mama this morning to read Deuteronomy chapter 6. Because Deuteronomy chapter 6 gives us God's manual for being a faithful parent. Matter of fact, look at what Moses writes there in verse 2. In verse 2, he says that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. The word there for keep in the original Hebrew it gives this word picture of being surrounded by a bush. You've heard folks pray before, hey God, if you would surround them with your protective bush or your protective hedge. It's along the same lines, that picture there. What are you saying here is that when you keep my commandments and if you keep my word, I'll put a protective hedge about you. What a great lesson that is to the 21st century family. God says, if you keep my commandments, what is he talking about? He's talking about the Ten Commandments. And somebody's quick to say, oh, that's Old Testament. Last time I checked, mine's still attached. Understand, when we're talking about keeping the Ten Commandments, we're not saying that you keep these in order to be saved, okay? We're not talking about you keep these in order to be uh, in a right relationship with God. Not too long ago, uh, there was a famous preacher who actually told his congregation, you guys need to unhinge your faith from the Old Testament. Well, we don't put our faith in the Old Testament. We don't put our faith in the New Testament. We put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we're looking at these commandments and when we're looking at these moral principles that are expressed in the Ten Commandments, it's not a situation where they came into existence when God first gave them to Moses. These indicate to us God's character. These indicate to us what God built the fabric of everything on. It's reality itself. And yeah, I am concerned that the Ten Commandments have been removed from the courtroom. It does bother me that the Ten Commandments are they're taken out of the government offices. Okay, I, I don't appreciate the fact that no longer are the Ten Commandments displayed in the classroom. But can I tell you what, what really bothers me more than any of those? That the Ten Commandments seem to be missing from the home today that we have forgotten the Ten Commandments. And because of it, we've messed up royally. Chuck Colson, the late founder of Prison Fellowship, he used to tell a story about him serving on board, on this board with a bunch of different CEOs of world-renowned companies. 
Without mentioning specifics, he just said there was a CEO of one particular company and he was bragging in one of these board meetings that his company was instrumental in having the Ten Commandments removed out of the classroom. And he said all of a sudden as the meeting continued, this CEO was saying, hey, listen, guys, uh, you know, well, Colson had had a conversation with him and said, hey, why, why do you have to remove them? Why, why aren't you so proud of that? And he said, well, because, you know, it offends people of other religions and not everybody's the same. And by the way, you got to separate church and state. And again, as the meeting continued, this guy starts talking about, well, why is teen delinquency on the rise? This guy even made the statement, theft among teenagers is alarming. That Colson said that he even said they're stealing from each other in school. What are we going to do about it? Chuck Colson said, maybe we should put up a sign that says, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> Folks, I want you to understand something today. God wants us to be a faithful parent and a faithful individual. And the reality is what we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a great nation rests upon great families. That if you remove the family union and it is no longer a priority or a focus, hear me, the nation is not going to crumble from enemies on the outside. The nation will begin crumbling from the inside. And so Deuteronomy chapter 6, he tells us that if you're going to be a faithful, God-honoring parent, there are three things that you must do in your home. Number one, and these are so simple, number one, lead with God's Word. I'm going to lead with His Word. Look what he writes in verse 6 again. He says, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. The word teach in verse 7 in the Hebrew means this, make a point. You need to make a point. Mom and dads, you need to make a point. You need to be purposeful in what you do and what you say. You have that responsibility to make the point to help your children learn. Moms and dads, teach them how to behave, but more importantly, teach them what to believe. Moms and dads, listen to me. Teach them not just how to play, teach them how to pray. Daddies, listen to me. Hey, don't just teach them how to hold a baseball bat. Teach them how to hold a Bible. That moms and dads, you and I have the responsibility to make a point while the children are still at home. Look in verse 7. He uses the word children. That means infant child. Man, what a word for the modern day family. And he goes on to say, talk of them when you sit in your house. Here's what God says, while they're little. Make a point while they're little. While they're still sitting in the house. And I know you young parents are thinking, oh my goodness, you know, there's never going to be a day when they're not sitting in the house. That's going to be a long time from now. I'm just saying, as one who has been there, you blink and it's gone. You better make a point while they're little. Teach them while they're sitting in your house. You better start early. You say, when do you start? I'd say this, when you bring that baby home from the hospital and you put them in the crib. That's when you start. That you start praying over them while they're there in the nursery in that crib. I'm just saying that long before your child hears that Bluey loves them, they better know that Jesus loves them. Some of you are like, Bluey, what's that mean? I didn't know. I asked one of our assistants this week, what cartoon does your kids watch? Long before they can spell I-P-A-D or I-P-O-D P -O -D or I-M-A-C, you better make sure they know how to spell the B-I-B-L-E. You better make sure that before they know how to operate their smartphone, they know how to use Scripture. I'm just saying, moms and dads, long before they get into their teenage years, you better make sure you do it early. Because here's what the devil has done. The devil has brought all this good stuff, and as a mom and dad, he's trying to get you to sacrifice the best for the good. Now hear me, there's nothing wrong with Little League. I love baseball. 
I'm telling you, I love watching my kid play. I've coached him his entire life. He's now in high school. I'm no longer coaching him. And so I go and I sit in the bleachers. And I like to sit there by myself. I don't want anybody else around me because here's what I'm saying to myself the entire time. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I had a friend come over at the last game and he was like, hey man, why are you sitting over here all by yourself? I'm like, I've got to. I'm so used to yelling and screaming and I'm trying to do what I told parents to do that I coach their kid. You let me be the coach. I love it. I love it. I love going and watching play. I love investing that. There's nothing wrong with Little League. Little League is good. There's also nothing wrong with soccer. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't know why you'd play it, but it's good. And there's nothing wrong with dance. It's good. There's nothing wrong with cheerleading. It is good. I'm just saying, if you let them get to be a cheer or a teenager and you've not taught them anything while they're little, it might just be too late. That we all know folks that say that they love Jesus, yet they have no time to gather together with his bride because they're trying to live out their dreams through their kid. Hello, did y'all hear what I said? You're looking at me like you don't think I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. Because the devil comes along and the devil says, Oh, this is good. This is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you'll just make sure your kid's involved in this, don't worry about church. Don't worry about those things. And I've had parents say this to me. Well, you know what? We use the ballpark as a mission opportunity. Can I just stop and say that might be true for one or two. But for the most of you, that's a lie. Thank you for that. He knows what I'm talking about. Right? Right? Don't sacrifice the best for good. If you don't concentrate on what's best, it might be too late. Look at that word diligently in verse 7. He says, you shall teach them diligently. You know what the word diligently means? It means to pray, to pierce, to pierce. It means this. When you're with those children, you better have conviction in your heart that what you're telling them is the truth. Now hear me, guys. It's a beautiful day when your children become adults and you begin to be their friend. But your calling while they're at home is not to be their friend. Your calling is to be a God-honoring parent. I'm amazed at some of the things I see. Not too long ago, I was, uh, I was at my favorite place in this world, the Walmart in Lynn Haven. And uh, when I'm feeling risky, I'll go to the Walmart on 23rd because you see some stuff there. You see some stuff there. You know I know what I'm talking about. Whew. I was at Walmart in Lynn Haven, and I was in line, and there was this, this little elderly lady behind me, and there was this dad and his, I don't know, five, six-year-old son in front of us. And, and, and they're at the register, and, you know, the dad's paying, and the son reaches over, and the son grabs he grabs some candy, and he says, I want, I want this candy. And the dad's like, no, no, you don't need the candy. You know, you have too much candy. And he's like, I want the candy. And the dad's like, no, no, no. You're gonna, we're about to go eat, and it's going to ruin your meal. And, and so there's a negotiation that is taking place and happening. I, I, I'd call it a hostage situation is, is, what is what is taking place. And then I kid you not, I kid you not, this kid He grabbed the candy, he starts throwing a temper tantrum, and he tells his dad that he's stupid. That's how I responded, as soon as he said it. And so I turned and I looked at this little old lady behind me, and we didn't even have a conversation, but our eyes met, and we were, you know, we were talking, but out talking. And and, and the conversation was this, ooh, this is going to get good. kid's throwing a tantrum, just told his dad that he was stupid. This dad turns around, sheepishly looks at us, reaches and takes the candy, pays the cashier for it, hands it to the kid who opens it and starts eating it as they walk out the store. And this little old lady said this, I'd just love to have that boy for five minutes. <laughs> five, five minutes. I mean, she wasn't talking about abusing him. She was talking about disciplining him. You say, what would your dad have done if you'd told him he was stupid? Oh, I'd never made that mistake. (laughs) No, sir, my dad taught respect from the beginning. 
I, he probably would have responded the same way I'd respond if my kids told me I was stupid. We were, we were talking to our daughter who's in college at Tennessee not too long ago, and, and she was talking about how some of the people that she's friends with, how they speak to their parents. And she's like, I'm blown away. If I spoke to my parents the way that I've heard them speak to their parents, you would get in your car and drive all the way up here. Here's what I thought as they walked out the store. That man is teaching his son that when he gets older and he wants something that he can't have, all he has to do is take it. And so begins a life of crime. And some of you are like, oh, you're making a much bigger deal out of that than you need to make out of that. Are you kidding me? Come on, man, that's not real. But the, real, the reality is we don't need to beat around the bush. We don't need to be wimps about it. We need to tell them the truth. And what Moses says here, we need to do it with some conviction. See, nobody today wants to tell the truth. And our kids are looking for someone to shoot it to them straight. And it's got to come from a mama and daddy who will stand in the home and be clear about what they believe. About what they believe. U.S. News and World Report tells us this, that right now the closest companion of children is their screen. Either a television screen or their phone screen. Time News says that movies and television shows are the chief sex educator in the United States. We are now learning that a teenager watches over 100 movies a year, and it's now believed that 80% of those movies the average teenager watches are rated at least R. And if you're one of those parents that believe that what your children watches doesn't make a difference, hey, the, the hamster's wheel is still there, but the hamster's dead. Are you kidding me? Folks, if we're not affected by what we see, they wouldn't charge five and a half million dollars for a 30-second commercial during the Super Bowl. And our children are exposed to all kinds of junk and parents just close their eyes or they allow their children to call the shots or they allow their children to close the door and they don't understand the damage that it is doing. You better have some standards or you're going to lose your child. You got to lead with God's word. You got to start early. Young parents, here's what you do. While they're in the womb, you start reading God's word to them. You start praying over them while they're in the womb, while they're laying in that crib, whatever it may be. You're speaking God's word over them. You're sowing in their life the power and the importance of leading a life with God's word. You don't need a handbook. You've got the book. Use the word of God. Lead with it. But then secondly, you got to live God's word. Look at verse 7. When you walk by the way. It means while you're doing life. While you're going about the daily business of being a parent. Live what you teach. Now, I've talked about our son and his sports and all that stuff. Our girls really never got into sports, but when they were younger, they were in dance. And, uh, you know, they would have all these uh, uh, costumes or wardrobes, excuse me, that they would have to buy for dance. And, you know, they would have recitals and various things like that. And I was at one of their recitals one time, and there was a friend of mine that was there, and he was a Methodist preacher, and he was having a good time with me because he's like, you're a Baptist preacher, and you're letting your girls be involved in dance. I can't believe you would do that. And I'm like, hey, brother, listen to me. The reason why I da don't dance has nothing to do with being Baptist. It's just the fact that I'm, I, I'm not a good dancer. And he was sitting there having a good time, and he was like, oh, look at your daughters. I guess you taught them everything they knew. They're handing them their ribbons, and they're handing them their trophies and stuff. I guess you taught them everything. And I'm like, that's exactly right I did. I taught them everything they knew. I didn't teach them a thing. I don't know anything about dance. I was raised in a church that said this, the knee that's dancing is probably not the knee that's praying. You're like, that's legalistic. I told you. I'm a recovering legalist. Would y'all like for me to dance right now? 
No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. No, 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 no. They won't let me come to Christmas if I do that. That was exciting, a proud moment. It always is when your kids receive something, right? But I'll tell you something that'll be better than that. Not when a trophy's involved, not when a ribbon's involved, but a crown's involved. That one day if somebody walks up to me and somebody says, Stephen, that young lady, Abby, or Stephen, that young lady, Emma, is a woman of integrity. She is a woman of character, that she loves Jesus Christ. She loves her husband, and she loves her children. That's a godly young woman. Did you teach her that? Did you teach her that 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 young man, Reed, is a godly man of prayer who loves Jesus and he loves God's word and he loves his wife and he loves his children? That's a godly young man. Did you teach him that? Wouldn't it be great to be able to say, yeah, I taught him that. I felt ill-equipped, but I taught them that. Well, how'd you teach them that? I just looked to my own heavenly father, and I just saw what he taught. You say, Dad, how'd you teach them that? What did you tell them? Hear me, guys. It's so much more than just what they hear you say. It's what they see you do. It's what they see you do. It's showing them. It's walking the talk. You're like, well, I would, but my kid won't listen to me say a word. I get that. I was on a flight one time. There were two ladies sitting right in front of me. They both had teenage daughters, and they were talking to each other. One woman said this to the other one. She said, my daughter doesn't tell me anything, and I'm scared to death. And the other one said, my daughter tells me everything, and I'm scared to death. No, it's not about them hearing you. Listen to me, guys. It's about them seeing you, seeing how you live your life, seeing how you uh, implement God's word into your life. So you lead with God's word and you live God's word. But then look in verse 7 again. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down. And when you rise up, you say, well, I do that, but I can't be a perfect parent. No, no, no. We're not talking about being a perfect parent. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. But we're talking about a faithful parent. See, what what I've heard about being a parent is this. About the time you've got the job figured out, you become unemployed. But there needs to be some consistency there. They don't need to see that you're hot, then you're not, and you're hot, and then you're not. I've had young parents tell me this, well, I don't want to be one of those preachy parents. Do you know that children are not so much turned off by a preachy parent as they are a phony parent? So you're teaching, right? You're leading with God's word. Here's what I believe, and you're living out what you believe. I'm not being phony, right? They can spot a phony a mile away. It's terrible when a parent is a phony. Some daddy who uses profanity six days a week, and then he's going to praise God on the seventh day. Some mama who loves the world for six days a week, and then all of a sudden she loves Jesus on the seventh day. Some daddy who fusses and fights with mama six days a week, and then he sits on Sunday with his arm draped around her. Our young people see that. But here's what we need today. Be sure that that child sees a fervent, passionate, sincere person who loves Jesus Christ with all their heart and is unashamed to tell people that they love Jesus Christ. And if they get happy in church, they might just clap their hand unashamedly and they go down to the altar and they pray unashamedly and they get excited and thrilled about the things of God. You've got to live it out before your child and before your teenager. Please hear me. Your race car driver, your ball team, Your stocks and bonds, you already get more excited about the things of God than you do those. And daddy, more than that son needing to know what your favorite brand of beer is. How about he knows your favorite Bible verse? Look in verse 8. 
You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Here's what he's saying. Everything you do ought to be controlled by the word of God. Everything you think about ought to be controlled by the word of God. Don't be a phony. A while back, I was sitting in the school pickup line, and you know how that can test your faith. And, and I'm one of these, whether it be the school pickup line or a drive through or anything, I'm one of these that I know you're not all the way up there to get your child or to pick up your order, but you still need to move your car so there's no gap in between the cars. That drives me crazy. I try to disengage, I try to look away, but it's just like, it's like somebody personally is insulting me, you know, and I'm like, move up, move up move up. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Move up. And so I was at the school pickup line one time, and it was one of those cars that would let two or three cars get links get between before they would move forward. And one time, it almost got to be three or four car links, and I assumed they were looking at their phone or whatever, and you know, I'm like, you know, I could, I could just whip out around them and get in front of them, but they frown on that at the school pickup line. And then I thought, you know, maybe they don't realize that the cars have moved forward, so I just kind of took my horn a little, you know, and just, I didn't hit it hard. I just, beep, just a little, beep, just, just, hey, there you go, move on up, move on up, beep. And, um, and, uh, and then this lady, uh, well, she expressed how fond she was of me, <laughs> telling me that I was the number one preacher in Bay County. But she used what we would normally assume is the number two finger. <laughs> you, you know where I'm going. Somebody's like, how crude that you would mention that. Hey, I've cleaned it up a lot. <laughs> On the back of her car, a big gold ichthus. Look, look, can I put that in layman's terms? A Christian fish. Right there on the back of her car. I'm following Jesus. You know, in the New Testament, so they could tell that because they were being persecuted. One person would come up and make a mark, and if the other one was a Christian, they would make the mark, and that would make the fish. She had that on her car. Below it on the bumper, I'm not even making this up. Honk if you love Jesus. <laughs> she gets up there. The kid gets in the car. I'm like, I know that kid. I know that kid. At first, I'm like, I think they go to our church. They didn't, though. They didn't. They didn't. And so I knew the kid from the ballpark. And so I saw the kid at the ballpark that night, and I'm like, hey, man, listen, man, I think your mom flipped me off at school today. <laughs> I said, I, maybe she didn't. Maybe I, I, I saw something wrong. He goes, oh, no, she probably did. <laughs> we did. He goes, but don't worry. If she had known that the preacher was in the car, she had never flipped you off. She doesn't flip off preachers. They can spot a phony a mile away. I got to live out God's word, right? I've got to live it out. They need to see the real us. They need to see a, a daddy that handles the Bible more than just in church. They, 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 they need to see a, a, a mama who believes in prayer. They, they need to see that God's day is a priority to the family, not they'll do it if they don't have anything else going on. Hey, guys, let me tell you something. They don't need to see church attendance as being a burden to you. They need to see it as a blessing to you. Live out God's word. Lead with God's word. Can I give you the last one? We've got time. How about it? Look after them with God's word. I told you it's so easy you could have written this yourself. Look after them. Look in verse 9. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So here's the deal. They didn't just write the law and, they, you know, little scrolls that they would roll up and put in what is called phylacteries. They would put in these little boxes that they would put on their head and put on their wrists so that my hand's not going to touch anything contrary to God's word. My, I'm not going to look at or think of anything. But they also wrote them on the gate of their house. They wrote script, they had scripture on the doorpost 
of their homes. And here's what it symbolized. It symbolized that everybody who passes through this gate, everybody who comes into this house, this is a house that's protected by the Word of God. This house is protected by what God has said. I'm just saying, guys, moms and dads, we got to look after our homes. We've got to protect our homes. How do we protect them? The same way that we lead, the same way that we live, by the truth of God's Word. Let me give you some practical ways. And we could spend the rest of the day talking about ways or things to implement on protecting your home or looking after your home. Here's practically some ways. The first one, this. Put a parent lock on some of your television channels. You're like, oh, you're one of those parents. Well, I, I trust my 13-year-old not to watch anything they shouldn't. For real? For real, you do? You really don't mean that. You say, well, why would you say that? Because I used to be a 13-year-old. And by the way, can I just stop and say this, Mom and Dad? Chances are, if they shouldn't be watching it, mm, you shouldn't be watching it. Hey, also... Listen, listen, let me just stop and give you this little bit of practical advice. Have some accountability when it comes to your kid's phone. You're like, well, it's their phone. I don't really want to snoop on them. Are you kidding me? Are you serious that you'd say that? Well, well, they pay for their phone. I don't care if they live in your house. It's your phone. You understand we're looking after our house. We're looking after our kids. We're being the God-honoring, faithful parents that we're supposed to be. Let me just stop and say this as well. Have a curfew for your children. And it's amazing to me how many parents, how many parents go to bed or they let them go into their bedroom with their date and shut the door. Are you kidding me? Do you know that 70% of all those kids who lose their virginity, they lose it in their parents' home? 50% lose it while their parents are asleep in the other bedroom, trusting that they're not doing anything they shouldn't do. I'm just saying, guys, we've got to protect our homes. We've got to protect our children and our families from the evil one because the Bible says this, he's roaming around like a roaring lion seeking to kill, steal, and destroy your family, your kids. And oh, God, help us to be mamas and daddies who talk about what we believe, we live what we believe, we protect what we believe. Last night, I know it was the last game of the World Series, and the Astros won. Dusty Baker, their manager, you, you, you may have seen the story. I think, I think he had managed for roughly 25 years. I may have that wrong, but, and he had never won a World Series. He was a Hall of Fame player. He'll be a Hall of Fame coach once he stops coaching. He's 70 years old, 70 years old. They interviewed him after the game, and here's what they said. Uh, they said, how does it feel to win your first World Series? And he's like, oh, it's great. It's awesome. He said, I can only think of one thing that would be better. And they said, what's that? He said, winning my second World Series. <laughs> Basically, he was saying this, I'm not quitting. I'm not retiring. Here he is, a Hall of Fame player, a Hall of Fame coach. And he says, nope, I'm going to keep on. True story that happened many years ago. They were renovating the Baseball Hall of Fame and as they were moving the cases around, they found a picture behind one of the cases. It was a picture of a guy that was wearing a baseball uniform, had Sinclair oil across the front. There was a letter that was stapled to the back of it. I want to read to you what the letter said. Dad, you've taught me how to pitch and catch. You came to all my games you even worked on the little league field on your day off. You were a Hall of Fame dad. I wish you were here to share this moment with me. A national sports magazine picked up the story. They ran it, and they actually found the guy who had placed that picture behind one of the exhibits. It was a man whose dad had died. He just knew that his dad was a Hall of Fame dad. 
and all by himself, he put his dad's picture with that letter behind a case of great ball players. And he inducted his dad into the Baseball Hall of Fame. When I read that story, I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be a Hall of Fame dad. I want to be a Hall of Fame parent. Do you know how you can be a Hall of Fame parent? When you hear that great umpire say, well done, good and faithful servant. Isn't that what we all want to hear at the end of our life? You say, well, it's hard. It's hard to raise kids today. No, it's not. It's not hard. It's impossible. Without Jesus. Philippians says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That some things with men, this is impossible, but yet with God, all things are possible. You know, the reality is that would apply to almost everything in life. I've had folks say to me, you know what? It's really, really hard to live a good life. No, it's not hard. It's impossible without Jesus. It's hard to have peace and purpose. It's impossible without Jesus. I had this conversation not too long ago with a man, and I asked him the question, if you were to die today, that you know that you would go to heaven. And he said it's impossible to know whether you would go to heaven or not. Nobody can know. I said, that's right, it is impossible. But Jesus makes it possible. And so today as we talk about being a Hall of Fame parent, and I know that, listen to me, I know that there's some of you in the room, and you're like, preacher, I raised them right. Taught them God's word. I lived it before them. And they rebelled against everything. Hear the promise of God's word. You set a foundation in their life. And don't you dare quit praying for them. And don't you dare let the devil discourage you by their rebellion. But don't you dare think your job's done. Continue to pray that what you sowed in their lives, the Holy Spirit will continue to bring up and pray for their salvation. Friend, hear me. You can't be a Hall of Fame dad or mom. You can't be a Hall of Fame individual unless you know Jesus. Do you? I'll ask you what I asked that man. If you were to die today, do you know that heaven would be your home? The Bible says this. It is only through those that are in Christ that you can know Heaven will be your home when you leave this earth. And so to all the moms and dads out there this morning, know that you've got a church that loves you and supports you, a church that's praying for you, and hear me. You've got a good, good heavenly father who has given us a great model and example of what it means to be a Hall of Fame parent. Turn to him. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? With your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Here's our invitation. And when I say invitation, I say this. We've studied God's word. The Holy Spirit of God supernaturally does something with his word from when it leaves my lips and hits your ears. I mean, the Holy Spirit of God could be speaking to you about something today that has nothing to do with being a parent, but it has everything to do with trusting Jesus. And so this morning, we... We're commanded to respond. We're pleaded with to respond. That the word of God would take root in our heart and it would bring about the beautiful fruit of obedience. So first, moms and dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters. This morning we we strung a bunch of families and kids right before this stage. I believe all of you would agree with me that there is power in prayer. That we made a covenant this morning. The parents did, the church did. Would you intercede on their behalf today? Would you pray for that 
child, that grandchild? Would you pray for that mom or dad? Would you pray and intercede on behalf of your family? In just a moment, we'll stand and sing and these steps up front, this altar. When's the last time, brother? When's the last time, sister, that you humbled your hearts, got on your knees, and cried out to a good, good father? There are others of you in this room that you've allowed the good things of life to cloud and take away and rob you of the best. That maybe today you would just say, forgive me, Father. Forgive me, Lord. I repent of the good and I embrace and run to the best. And then there are others of you here today. Today, you need Jesus. We had one in the first service came down and said, you know what? Today I'm ready to give my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord. Prayed right there at the front, surrendered to Jesus. Is that you today? Is that you today? Friend, it's impossible for you to work your way to heaven. You'll never be able to do it. It'll frustrate you. It is impossible. Why try to do the impossible when God's already made the way possible? through a relationship with Jesus. This morning, would you turn to him? Would you call upon his name? Would you surrender control of your life to him? As we stand, you come down to one of these pastors. Today, I give my life to Jesus. You take out your phone and text. You'll see words on the screen that you can text. You come out of the welcome booth after the service. Today, I've surrendered to Jesus. What do I do next? But why wait for those when today you can publicly respond? I'm not ashamed. I give my life to Jesus. Oh God, may you speak, may we listen, and may we do. Thank you for being a faithful, good father. And thank you, God, today for not giving us what we've earned or deserved, but thank you for giving us what we need. Grace, mercy, forgiveness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? As our pastors come, you come as you want to